curating project, curating projects uh, in London as well as Singapore, uh, advising and dealing in the arts. Um, and I would say over the wide spectrum of the market being emerging artists, established artists, or masters as well. And uh, I've been collaborating with different galleries. So I worked with Pearl Am Galleries for five years, mm -hmm. uh, based from London, but traveling extensively uh, in Asia. And uh, I've been collaborating, as you mentioned, with different galleries on different art fairs. I particularly like, to be honest, I don't, I have a very eclectic taste mm -hmm. and uh, I like working across different artists. Uh, it's true they have a tropist for Asian art, uh, having worked with Pearl and having a personal connection with uh, Southeast Asia in particular and female artists, but uh, Moreover, I always like to discover new artists. So what is that particular thing that you look out for in an art practice or an artist when you spot a new artist at a fair or maybe um, through some curatorial exhibition or a project that you happen to visit? What's, what's your inherent kind of take on that? I think whatever is what is important for me uh, and discovering your gallery and discovering your artist at the Indian Art Fair in uh, in February was a good example for me. What I'm looking for is a distincting visual language. Mm -hmm. Artists who truly have an identity. Mm -hmm. I, artists that you can really identify being the material they will use. In the case of Narayan, is all the industrial and automotive spare part that he's using in his sculpture uh, and all his work. Uh, some artists like Kate Maguire is a British artist based in the UK I've worked with as well, who use feathers. Mm -hmm. um, it can be the medium and the material, the discourse as well. So for me, what is important is really to look for artists who have a distinctive languages. Mm -hmm. Because I believe that artists are like a researcher. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they research the field of politics, sociology, anthropology, psychology, even literature. So mm -hmm. they have to offer us a distinct vision of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Noel, what, what is your take on this particular question? Um, I mean, I, I, it's, it's very similar to Virginie's. Um, for me, it's always like, you know, good, the, the idea of good or, or bad or talented or not talented, it's, it's so personal in our field that for me, it's more of like, I look for a distinct point of view. And if I feel like the artist has asked questions and has answers to those questions and is clear about what they're doing and why, mm -hmm. uh, that, that shows through to me normally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. does. And so for me, that's, you know, that's when I start paying attention. It's like, okay, this, you know, this practitioner knows why they're doing this. Mm -hmm. And they can, they can, they can back it up with research. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they're using a certain material, why? If, if it's a, it's, if it's a film and not a painting, why? Um, mm -hmm. I feel like if those questions come through, then you know that you really have someone that has legs in their career mm -hmm. um, and is worth paying attention to and is worth supporting. So how how important is the visual element uh, in the sense like, the, because, you know, we always kind of, the first thing we look at uh, is, is the visual. Uh, so how important is that? Um, and and uh, uh, I understand that both of you would like to first get attracted by the visual and then back it up with, with, with the research that, the artist has done uh, but a lot of times um, uh, there might not be a great story uh, behind the work uh, so how do you deal with that like how how important is the visual purely by itself and and does it kind of uh, does it take you the whole nine yards in kind of recommending that work to someone or or you still want to dig deeper i think i think that the the visual is really important but that doesn't mean that it needs to be beautiful like it can be good and not beautiful it can be stimulating and appealing but like ugly like that you know these these things can and 
happen in art. Um, and also sometimes a piece of art is just really beautiful. And uh, an artist just makes really beautiful paintings mm -hmm. or, or so, you know, whatever it may be. And, you know, there's a, there's a place for that too. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's the most interesting place for me, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that I don't love it and appreciate it. Um, so I, you know, again, it's, it's so subjective that I think that like, you know, it, it depends on, I also look at artists, based on the projects that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes what I'm looking for is that, you know, that beautiful artwork. Um, and when, I, you know, it really works for me when that beautiful artwork has the backing that I talked about, you know, five minutes ago, where, you know, is there a reason for it? You know, mm -hmm. can I answer the questions that they're trying to ask? Mm -hmm. um, sure. Um, am I convinced? And then it's like, you know, great. Let's, you know, let's talk about this beautiful work more. Mm -hmm. okay. So this this takes me to this whole classic uh, kind of debate we always have over art is, is, is decorative art always good or bad? And whether artists who do decorative works, can they kind of really kind of progress in their career and be acquired by museums? So I think based on uh, our discussion today, Art can be decorative or ugly, provided if it is backed by good research and 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 it has a great compelling story and and maybe if the artist can convince their vision uh, articulately to to the audience, probably that does the does that does the job. Is that correct? I think we're. I, I don't want to confuse decorative with visually appealing. Those are two different things, right? Sure. Sure. Yeah, I see you nodding. Do you wanna do you wanna jump in here? I feel like you agree. No, I don't think art has to be decorative. I think it's it's something totally different. Uh, if you want decorative art, you work with an architect or a designer, interior designer. Mm -hmm. If you want art who is um, sharing a language, sharing um, a message, sharing a research, then you work with a with an art advisor. I think for me, it's too totally different things. If art is aesthetic, it's an element of chance, which happens by chance, but it's not what the intention, the first intention of, of an artist. I mean, an artist, for instance, which I love, and I attended uh, one of his conference in Paris last week, actually, is Thomas Saraceno. Uh, Thomas Saraceno is doing, I mean, he's Argentinian based in Berlin, is doing a, a, a total research and basically what he's proposing is a different model of the world mm -hmm. you know it's scientific it's politics and it is in some way aesthetic as well but the aesthetical element just happened by chance is not what is after I when he's, he's doing his work and I think mm -hmm. that it's very important the intention of the artist sure so it's very interesting because in India while the art market is evolving and growing and, and young collectors, uh, their first point of reference normally tends to be architects or interior designers who kind of influence their uh, decisions towards art collection. And, and this is very important. What you brought out, Virginie, is that if you want to collect decorative art, that's when you go through a certain medium, like maybe an interior designer. And when you want uh, art, uh, that's when an art advisor comes into play. And that's that's a very important distinction you made. And I think that's a great point. Thank you. So how do you discover new and emerging artists? Like what are the sources? May it be fairs, galleries, or online platforms? How do you kind of, uh, or, or through your peer network? Uh, how important is the kind of the peer network of recommendations? Uh, if you can just throw some highlights. I would say all of the above, all you mentioned. Personally, I try as much as possible since obviously the end of the pandemic to uh, to see art in flesh. So I do as well online research, but I tend to do it after I've seen a work or after I've been recommended to look at a work by um, a, 
an advisor friend, by a curator, by a gallery, so even by artists. So I travel a lot. I go to art fairs. I go to Biennale. I'm going every year since, I mean, not every two years, obviously, since uh, 27 to uh, to the Venice Biennale. I go into Documenta. I try to see as many Biennale as possible. I try to see as many art fairs as possible. I try to see shows as well. It's very important. In museums, in foundations, I have the luxury to live in Europe where we have these incredible shows going on, obviously, in these incredible museums. So I spend a lot of time in museums and galleries. Okay. So it's a constant uh, travel and uh, it's a hunt, basically. <laughs> sure. So, Noel, I think I'm, I'm sure your answer would be similar if I would like to tweak it a little bit and, and, and put it more relevant to the Indian context. So in India, within India... How do you kind of try and kind of spot new emerging talent? Um, I pay attention to all of the shows that are opening, um, the gallery shows particularly throughout the country. Um, I look at a lot of PDFs because mm -hmm. you know, India is large, um, and I, you know, I, I live in a city that doesn't have much contemporary art. Um, so, whereas in Delhi, you know, I, I, I'd be, if I was still in Delhi, I'd be telling you a different story, but. Now I look at a lot of art through catalogs and PDFs. And when I can travel, I do. Um, and it's uh it's not as enjoyable, but you know, it's 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 the solution to to my specific problem. Um and then there are peers um and also um other artists. Other artists really give great recommendations for other artists, and I rely on my artist network a lot. Um, especially with India um, for, you know, younger artists that maybe aren't gallery represented yet, um, but they were maybe juniors in college with them. Um, this has been a really successful model for, for me in terms of just like finding artists, but also understanding what's happening, mm -hmm. you know, at that sort of coming out of art school level um, and where the aesthetic is sort of, going in in you know the different art like the different art colleges uh graduate graduates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so is there a particular pattern or some key factors that that you particularly look out for while while choosing uh you know artists to collect or or represent or curate or kind of recommend to a collector uh what's your kind of uh, you know the top four things or the three things that you look for in an in an artist's practice when you do that recommendation? Um, every project that I, I have will have a different mandate um, for the, the type of work that I'm looking for, including, you know, what I, what I look for personally will have a different mandate than, you know, what I'll do on, but you know, what I'll look for on behalf of a, um, a client. Um, but I think, you know, once I understand what the particular need is of a project, again, you know, I really go back to our original conversation that, you know, the art still needs to resonate with me as, you know, as good in, in the definition that, you know, that we discussed earlier, where like, is it, does it answer the questions? Mm -hmm. You know, does it have its point of view? And then it can be, you know, you know, it can be across mediums, it can be across price range, um, it can be, you know, across, you know, borders, you know, Indian or international, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter at that point, as long as those questions are answered, then I feel like, okay, I'm, I'm suggesting artists that I stand behind. Any particular art, young artist uh, practice that you kind of really kind of uh, fell in love with and have promoted or or get excited about uh, or one or two or a couple of them if you would like to share I mean that you know one of the reasons we know each other is because Narayan's work excited me so much yeah. <laughs> um, and that was the beginning of you know our relationship um and uh you know he's, he's not a young artist um but he was an artist that that I think 
you know, is is getting more attention now. Um, that was really that's really been well deserved and and coming for a long time. Um, yeah. And yeah, there 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 are definitely a few others. So Virginie, uh, just for the record, Noel introduced me to Narayan's practice. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's so funny because like my connect with Virginie is also through Narayan's practice. So Narayan is the common factor for all of us here. <laughs> Great. So, so, so Virginie, would you like to throw some light on your kind of... Yes. Yes, no, you've got a great eye, Noel, because it's such a, a an amazing artist. It was really my highlight of my uh, my visit of uh, the Indian Art Fair in Delhi uh, last February. Um, yeah, I kind of use, I would say, more or less five metrics. Um, first is I always look at the gallery. Does an artist have a gallery representation or not? Mm -hmm. And if he does, what type of gallery represent the artist? If it's what I call a Basel gallery, so obviously a gallery which will be exhibited at Art Basel, being Miami, Hong Kong, or Basel, or the Freeze Gallery, or even a gallery, a younger gallery exhibiting in fairs like Artissima, or Brussels, or Art Singapore, or Expo Chicago, fairs that I appreciate. Mm -hmm. The second metric, I will lo look at collections where the artist is, uh, public and private and corporate collections, as well as museum collections. So obviously, if you are in a major collections like Zabludovich collection in London or Valeria Napoleone, for instance, who collects a female artist or the Sandani Foundation, for instance, that's, you know, um, a plus museum uh, collections, obviously the Tate, MoMA, uh, Pompidou. So I look at the collections and uh, the third uh, criteria will be as well to look at uh, the Biennale where the artist has been shown. You know, it can be the Venice Biennale or Documenta, but it can be Biennale like the Guangzhou Biennale, for instance, which is a very good Biennale in Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and last but not least, the auction records, because even young artists, you know, and I have an example of an artist I collected recently, uh, his prices over the last few years, I mean, the, the last sales in Sotheby's a few weeks ago, have totally shoot to the roof. So that's basically the different metrics I kind of use mm -hmm. when uh, uh, I discover a young artist. I think uh, that's incredible and that's really that would be really helpful for a few collectors who would like to kind of, you know, use a set of metrics to kind of base their, um, you know, uh, decisions over art collection. Um, so what what criteria do you personally use, uh, uh, you know, when you want to kind of, uh, for example, you were, uh, you worked as an ambassador for Asia Now and, and if, if Asia Now team asked you to kind of suggest a gallery or, 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 or a particular artist practice, um, would would your answer be different than the metrics already laid out or you would kind of have a different process for suggesting suggesting an art practice or a gallery for that yes i mean i would use the metrics i mentioned and i will use what we we spoke about uh, at the beginning of our conversation you know to look for artists who have something to say mm -hmm. to look for artists who have a distincting practice and mm -hmm. to look for artists who have a distincting visual language mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it can be, again, emerging artists who may not be in museum collection yet, who may not have been sold at auction yet, who may not be in Biennale yet, but have all this potential to mm -hmm. be in uh, those different mm -hmm. metrics. So Narayan, for me, was one of them when I discovered him in India. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks. So, so Noel, my question to you would be, how would you track the success and growth of artists you have supported in the past? Um. I would use Virginie's metrics. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I think that when it, you know, if, if I look at, you know, the all, the work I'm doing, and you know, I I don't I don't work on acquisition very much, right? So for mm -hmm. me, for artists that I've worked with or that I've been involved with, um, and I think that, you know. The, the best thing for an artist is to find the right gallery, um, which is the right business partner for them. Um, and so, you know, first, and because I, you know, especially in the last years, I've been working with younger artists, um, it's sort of like, okay, find them the right advocate, the right business partner. And it'll, it'll, that 
partner will help them um, hopefully with Biennale presence and institutional presence and getting into those right collections um, because and it's you know it's really a marriage um, between the, the the curatorial sort of practice and vision of the gallery matching with the artist mm -hmm. um, and once you have that that like for me when I when I want the best for an artist I that the first thing I want is for them to find the right gallery for them. and then hopefully the rest happens. Great. And so, Virginie, uh, are there any particular examples of artists, uh, you know, uh, who have achieved a lot of uh, recognition uh, now, but earlier they were spotted by you uh, very young in their career? Uh, you know, would you have any such examples from from maybe Asian artists or or any other artists in particular? Yeah, I have two artists because I was thinking at your question earlier. Um, one I've been following and be became a friend, as mm -hmm. it uh, often happened. I've been following for over eight years now, mm -hmm. which is Joel uh, Andriano Mes. Oh, sorry, I was having a challenge to pronounce his name correctly. Joel Andriano Me Ariosa, who is a French Madagascar artist, mm -hmm. who is the first and only artist who actually represented a Madagascar, the Venice Biennale. Mm -hmm. I discovered Joel's work at Art Brussels with a very good gallery called Sabrina Amrani from Madrid. Mm -hmm. uh, Joel just started representation as well in Paris with Almin Resch, with, which is one of the top international galleries. Mm -hmm. His work was presented at Paris Plus and all sold. Uh, he has done collaboration with uh, Dior. He has done a beautiful Dior bag. Uh, he has done during Paris Plus a collaboration with Diptyque. Uh, I as well collect some of his work. Uh, yes, so it's been an incredible journey to to see how his practice has developed, the type of project he's been involved, a type of collaboration he's been working on, as well as uh, uh, the gallery representations that he has had over the years. So Joel is one example. And another artist who I collected a few years ago, uh, Mohamed Sami, is an Iraqi artist based in London. He studied at Goldsmiths. Uh, and when I discovered him, he just had a show at uh, Young Gallery in London, um, Patrick Hyde Gallery. I uh, acquired one of his work. And a few months later, he was part of a major show at the Award Gallery in London. Then he had a solo show with a gallery in London. Then he was part of the Camden Art Centre, a beautiful exhibition as well. And now, in last a few weeks ago, he had an exhibition in New York with Augustine Loring. And I have to say, his work has just been sold at auction uh, a few weeks ago at Sotheby's. And the uh, estimated of one of his work was between 50 to 80,000 pounds. And he reached uh, more than 500,000 pounds. So 10 times the lower wow. estimate. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. And again, when I work, when I collected uh, Mohamed's work was not because of any speculation, because I don't sell uh, the work I've collected, not so far. But it's it's really because I was totally exactly what we were talking about. He had a very specific visual language. He's an incredible painter. The texture of his work is really stunning. Uh, he had he, he, you can really see his his story as well behind the work. You know, coming from Iraq, is uh, an incredible artist. So uh, this question of mine going going just adding to what uh, Virginie just said is both to Noel and 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 uh, Virginie because both of you are not of Indian origin but are in a way associated and working with with Asian galleries and Noel particularly living in Jaipur. Uh, what is what is what is it required for Indian galleries, Indian artists, and the Indian art scene? Uh, to be taken more seriously internationally. Uh, we, we still don't see the kind of respect that we should uh, or the recognition that we, we, we which India as a community uh, should should receive when we travel internationally. And, and what is what is that which is missing that we need to do as a community at large? Um.
I want to I want to be careful because I, I I don't think that it's not respected, but I think that there's a there's a a market perception difference. Um, a lot of that just has to do, in my opinion, with um, change. Uh, it's you know it is it is still very difficult um, or very expensive for Indian collectors to bring international art into the country. Um, and because of that, a lot of our buyers continue to buy domestically um, because they don't want to pay a, you know, a, a very high tax on top of what they're already buying for the work. Um, and I think that because, because of that, there's, it's, we're, you know, it's just, we're still more insular um, than we, because internationally, institutionally, you know, our region is very well recognized. Um, so from an institutional perspective, I think, you know, we're, you know, we, we're being looked at and we're, we're being acquired. Um, but I think for, you know, for us to see sort of real change in terms of the market, it, it really has to do with this exchange between, um, private collections, which just isn't happening as much. And I, I, this is why I, I think. Okay. Angel, Angel, huh? What is your take on this? It honestly is a bit difficult for me to comment because I don't have the knowledge and the experience that you have and uh, Noel have of the Indian market, which is kind of new to me, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. But from what I've seen when I was in India uh, last February, I think it's important to distinguish what we were as well talking about, uh, decorative art and fine art. Mm -hmm. And I think it's two different objectives. So basically someone who wants to buy an artwork has to ask uh, himself the question, for which reason does he want to acquire an artwork? Is it just to go with a nice sofa, just to go with a nice decoration? Mm -hmm. Or is it because he wants to live with the art, the art talk to him, to so have artwork become part of his intimacy be, being part of his family he wants to engage with the artist he wants to visit the studio of the artist he wants to follow the career of the artist he wants to to he likes to be questioned as well by the type of message the artist is trying to go to put through through his artwork mm -hmm. so it's two different approach mm -hmm. the question is what do uh indian collectors want what are they ready to to look at i don't know but what was your impression when you visited India Art Fair? Too, may, too much decorative art. Mm -hmm. So that you is know? what my question was then geared towards is how do we change this? Because, you know, we as galleries also continuously face this challenge. Should we kind of dilute our kind of uh, curatorial uh, program to kind of add more decorative works just to survive? Um, because we also need to survive at the end of the day. And, and if that is what... Uh, mostly selling is 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 the dilemma, and that is what I wanted to highlight basically. So I think your your answer addresses that quite well. Um, I think um, I, so. Okay, the last question for today's session would be: uh, Are there any specific courses, publications, or resources that you find value valuable? Um, you know about being informed. Uh, you know, staying informed in the art world. Um, personally, I mean, I, I read the art newspaper almost religiously. Um, I do as well sometimes specialist courses. I'm contemplating to do one actually in photography starting next week in London. Um, I did as well some online uh, courses. I try to learn constantly because the more I learn and the more I realize I have to learn. <laughs> sure, no, I understand that. And it's very, very essential with things changing so fast and, and you know, you traveling across the world, across various geographic regions, uh, it's important to be updated with knowledge. Uh, Noel, would you like to highlight any particular publications, uh, anything like that? Um, and I, I try to stay on top of um, the auctions that, that I, not only do I find it interesting, but I find it really important um i think i think it's really important to understand <clears throat> what's happening in the secondary market mm -hmm. 
then um, I, I pay there, you know, there, there are a few institutions um, that I look to often um, in terms of what shows they're having and what sort of programming they're doing, what they're writing about, what their curators are writing about. Um, I, I, you know, there, there are specific key people within institutions that I follow very closely for, um, for information. Would you like to name some of them? No, <laughs> not off the top of my head. Okay, great. So I think uh, we are at the end of our session. I'm if if you have any questions, uh, I would like to take these questions now. Uh, please uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the questions if you have any. Uh, Purvi Sultani has asked a question, and what if the artist doesn't have a gallery? So uh, I think uh, uh, you need to ask a more kind of uh, structured question because we don't understand what you mean by this question. So if you want to unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'd asked that question uh, when Virginie was um, mentioning her five criteria of... Um, kind of uh, going through how she collects her artists. And then she mentioned that, okay, if the artist has a gallery, then X, Y, Z. But then uh, I don't think we touched upon when the artist doesn't have a gallery. So that was when I had posted the question. No, I, it's a very good question. And you're totally right. Often an artist, uh, an artist can be a very good artist and not have a gallery representation. And I have actually an example of an artist I've been uh, placing in different collections for the last five years with a young French painter called Maxime Biou. Uh, B-I-O-U. Uh, I really encourage you to follow his work. He's on Instagram. Ma uh, Maxim is not working with any particular gallery, although he just had, uh, he was part of a group show curated by Edouard Vigneault, he's a French artist and curator at Galerie Perrotin in Paris uh, in July. Uh, Maxime has uh, done residency, prestigious residency with the French uh, government, uh, Ministry of Culture in Madrid at Casa Velasquez. He's doing a residency at the moment in uh, Beijing. Uh, he's already in the museum collection, a top tier museum in Paris, and he's been placed in a couple of major private collections. So for an artist who is not represented by a gallery, I look at his potential. And uh, I look as well as, he, as we say, his practice, uh, his own visual language. Um, and an artist can be a good artist, uh, still be included and followed by curators. Uh, talking in this particular case of Maxim, I had uh, curators and I had uh, collectors buying his work without seeing it in flesh, just through a PDF. Uh, because they totally uh, love the work and as well because I guess they trusted my judgment and uh, they trusted uh, the type of exhibition where it was included. Got it. Thank you so much. Bhavish, if you want to go ahead and ask your question, please. Thank you so much. It was uh, quite interesting how you guys uh, spoke about the depth and the research bit. So I use uh, rope as my material and through every work, I'm like sort of exploring existence. Um, but to be able to explain the depth of it, uh, I need listeners' attention and time, which I find is my biggest challenge. Um, how would you suggest I may do that? I don't know, Noel, if you want to. Um, how, how do you generally show your work? at the moment, how is it being seen? So I also am represented by Iram, uh, Iram Art. But uh, so far I have like, you know, um, uh, people have shown interest in my work and there's like, uh, but I also want, in addition to the interest that one might have in acquiring the work, which I really appreciate. I mean, obviously that's the, um, you know, that's the biggest dream of any artist. But I, I also want, them to appreciate the depth that goes into it, the study that goes into it, and my thought process, which I find is uh, is is really really important to the work. And when you combine uh, the research or the thought behind it with the with the aesthetics, 
I find the work becomes uh, much more powerful. But uh, I find it, I mean, pre, pre-Iram, obviously, uh, I have found it difficult to be able to uh, get that sort of attention from the listener. Well, um, hopefully having, you know, Iram support now will, will help. But, uh, and even, you know, even so, I think um, invite as many people to your studio as possible. Um, I think studio visits are really important, intimate ways for um, peers and, and potential collectors uh, to understand your work. Um, talk about it, you know, on social media, show your work on social media. I mean, any, do all of it because I think sometimes people are listening more than you know. Um, I also think it's important to understand that like your work has to you you have to know why you're doing it you you have to have that perspective and if you need to explain it too much then you need to perhaps look again at what you're doing um because you know i think when Vir- Vir- virginia talk about you know that that point of view um it's like a confidence that that comes through in in, in the work um, so, so if, you know, if you have to explain and explain and explain and you feel like people aren't listening, um, maybe, you know, you need to review it yourself also. Sure. Thanks. Uh, a few people have asked the question whether, uh, we'll be kind of, uh, uh recording, uh, and, and sharing. We will be sharing, uh, we normally share, uh, the recordings on Zoom if the, speakers have no issue with that uh but there are certain speakers who object and so 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 we'll probably uh, this particular session will be put on youtube but not all of them will be put on youtube so i think that answers the question there and i think there's one more question and then we can wrap up this uh this session uh Someone is asking a question, uh, where do artists or young galleries approach find the right opportunities to connect with prospective clients uh, to showcase their works and collections. I think um, this question has been asked a lot of times earlier, but we'll still take it up uh, if, if you would like to answer that. So I, I think, yes, we, we mentioned it. It's important to, to to go to, I would say for an artist, mostly to go to Biennale, where you can interact with curators. Uh, I think uh, curators play a very important role as a mediator between an artist and the public and institution and collectors. So I would I would not really recommend an artist to go to art fairs because art fairs can be a bit challenging for an artist. But I would mostly recommend an artist artist to go to biennales and try to engage uh, with curators, including young curators of the same generation who are more willing to uh, understand the message and uh, and the stage was uh, the artist wants to uh, to share with his audience. And, and and I think Bhavish, this also adds to your question, which you kind of uh, posed earlier. And and this is a very important uh, learning. I think what you're highlighting is uh, rather than fairs, artists rather doing biennales and and trying and finding uh, curators who can probably resonate more with with the practice they want to share and and uh, make them understand. Um, <clears throat> any more questions, guys? Great. I think, uh, thank you, Noel, and thank you, Virginie, for this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. We'll end the session now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.